thank you so much for the very nice intro, uh, and thank you guys for your time and, uh, and for thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, let's get back to the subject pretty much straightforward. Yeah, so um, is this the first time you're seeing me or everybody has attended the keynote? Who, please raise your hand if it's the first time. Okay, so I have to introduce myself. Okay, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Paula Jai, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm the CEO of Secure, which is a cybersecurity company. And uh, basically, as I was mentioning on a keynote, celebrating 10 years from now on in cybersecurity, uh, doing pretty much the same things, but growing and expanding. Uh, maybe I should say something different than I said on the keynote then so for the rest of the guys. Uh, some of you were asking how big is the team right now. And uh, right now the team is uh, 38 people. So from the last year, we actually grown a lot. And uh, it was very hard to find good skills uh, at some point, but we kind of managed, so we tried to move into this direction. And if it's my background, I do also penetration tests. We deliver trainings. We've got over 40 trainings uh, that we have custom made uh, in, in our house. And uh, this is pretty much what we do. So everybody in our team is a security-minded person. Me too, even though having that business role, I try to still uh, be up to date. One thing for sure, and it's important in cybersecurity, uh, anything uh, wouldn't be possible if it wasn't uh, if I wasn't there with my team, because there are so many things happening in cybersecurity and so many issues, so many vulnerabilities in many different solutions, not necessarily Microsoft Linux, etc., but also solutions that uh, technically it's hard to keep up with that uh, by yourself. So it's always good to team up, and therefore that part of the presentation. Uh, of course, I'm the author of the presentation, but some of the tools that we're going to be also playing with, it's not only me writing this, it's also my team. So I really always appreciate the teamwork uh, out there. And uh, that's a little bit uh, regarding the introduction. So uh, as you already know, uh, speaking at the various conferences, uh, having technically blog secureacademy.com together with my team, and in general, um, the concept of the of the block is uh, very straightforward. Um, there is always, uh, technically, as you see by the next slide, of course, something something for us. So it could be quiz that we are always uh, recommending to take as a good source of knowledge. But it could be also different types of videos, which we release literally every week. It's called Secure Hacks Weekly, and it's our newsletter. And um, whoever is subscribed, these guys, these guys know. Uh, we try to be as much up to date as we can, and that's pretty much the concept out there. So how to hack to X, 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 and then you name it, and then basically we try to extract different data uh, from different areas uh, in the operating system. All right, so let's get immediately to the subject. Basically, whenever we are thinking about operating system and uh, all these important things to know about storing our identity, uh, we're going to be discussing during that 45-minute session, so it's a pretty uh, intense session um, at the same time, about things like credentials. So question is, what is a credential in the operating system? Let's define it first to work on it later. And I'm going to use in a moment the same slide that I use in a keynote, but we're going to actually talk about it from a little bit different perspective. So you will see that in a moment. So yeah, I really don't like definitions, but that actually makes sense. It's a definition that we decided to write by, our, by ourselves to keep it very straightforward and reasonable. So credentials is a set of data that allows the other people out there, other services, etc., to believe uh, myself when I tell who I am. So I'm this, okay, prove it, I'm this, thank you so much. Yeah? So the reason why we describe it this way is because on the keynote as well, we are talking about cache log on data, so cache credentials, to define that these actually are not credentials. Yeah? So I was technically making a demonstration regarding that, but on this session we're going to learn a little bit more about this um, to, to know a little bit of the theory being in the background of the cache log on data. So we already discussed that part on the keynote, but let me rise it and let me technically make it even more technical. So at the very beginning we mentioned that there is a boot key. How does the boot key look like? So boot key is actually something that is quite easily extractable and that's something that we can get from the uh, operating system where we have an appropriate tools and that's basically what we're going to do. So over here what you see it's a machine where we're going to use for that and our new addition of a CQ secrets damper, uh, where technically you've got a boot key uh, to be exported like that. So this is a very easy part. Yeah. So we can see that the boot key is something like 8B8 something something. Yeah? So what is this boot key about? That boot key protects systems credentials. And that is so important because anything, if you are more on a protection level or more on the hackers level, then we all need to either take care of a system hive 
or um, steal system hive. So every single time you are stealing some kind of data credential related in the system, don't forget to steal system. Um, system registry hive, because this is what contains the boot key and that affects lots of different types of cache log on data, uh, secrets or any other secrets that we have in the operating system. So this is how we extract it. Now we're going to be playing with that in a many, many different levels because our job would be to actually get access to hashes database in various ways. For example, we've got ntds.dint, and uh, even though that session is going to be technical, what I would like to give you is a tip, how we are able to extract the data with a kind of a slow pace so that we all get it right. After leaving this session, you should be familiar with all these techniques that we are um, talking about. So all the tools and techniques and how, how to move forward if you would like to actually extract certain type of a data from the operating system. So long story short, just to sum up, in the operating system, we've got the boot key, which is in a system hive, and various secrets, which are actually uh, protected by, by that particular boot key. And the boot key, by the way, has always been there. So regardless of the operating system that you are actually using, um, boot key is always extractable in the same way. Boot key, by the way, itself consists of the class names that are mentioned in the green uh, left top circle. So we've got a data, JBG, SKU1, and JD. Yeah. So these are the these are the registry areas. If you go to the registry, could you like extract it in a clear text? No, because we are not talking about the values. We are talking about the class names, and class names are to be grabbed when you have an appropriate API that you are calling for. And basically, you need to have probably some kind of a tool. And this is really what we do inside our tool to extract that type of information. So, uh, long story short, this is pretty much how we are able to move forward with that type of secrets. Now. What I would like to show you is how, eventually, we are able, on a real-life example, to extract uh, well different types of data in the operating system, and how uh, what's the result out of that. Yeah, so we're going to start at that certain level uh, with the ntds.dit, so the Active Directory uh, Domain Controller database, to learn, in general, how different types of information in that area is actually saved. So this is going to be one of the cases. And as well, um, what can we do maybe to protect it? But that's that's something that's going to gonna come. Uh, for simplification, let me explain, of course, because we've been extracting data from, um, so from some database, what's the protection level and technically what are we dealing with while we are discussing um, the security of these kind of databases. So in order to be able to get the hash, for example, from some database, and it works similarly, but the process is a little longer for NTDS.dit, we've got something like that. It's a technical presentation, as we mentioned. We, need, we don't need to really remember that, but let me mm, really spot a couple of things over here. First of all, point number one, we've got a boot key. So classes from etc. Yeah, so we've got that part. Now. Point number four and point number five are interesting, as well as point number two. Uh, well, all of them are interesting at the end. Uh, we can just <laughs> mention them in a different order. Yeah? But at the end, uh, point number two is kind of funky because it actually contains a constant value of, as we see, exclamation mark at hash dollar percent, etc. Right? So we could be wondering, okay, why is that so? And the funky part about that is why not? Not everything needs to be with, with the great quality, but imagine like, I've always imagined this kind of like, it's like a movie, that there are developers sitting somewhere in a basement and eating pizza and they're working for Microsoft and they're like, hey, well, how, what do you think, buddy? How, how do you think we should secure some database? And he's like, I don't know, man. Let's just like use some kind of a random string. Okay, blah, blah, blah. And then pretty much this is what they did. I don't know if pizza was involved and basement as well, but definitely that kind of approach. So at the end, one of the strings that is actually securing a sound database, as well as NTDS.dit, looks like that. Yes, that's a flat string that is taken into consideration that you use to generate also uh, the key. Uh, with yeah, so uh, and then you've got a string anum which is like in the, in the middle of the slide, and then you've got a zero one two three and so on. So it's kind of funny to have actually that kind of values involved yeah, but that's the fact. Now mystery revealed because lots of lots of articles, lots of uh, different knowledge sources, they do claim that Windows is using MD5. Well, Windows can process MD5 absolutely, but not in the case of the hashes. In hashes, we produce MD4, and we use MD4. Is MD5 engaged? 
Yes, it is, but it does not explain why someone says that hashes are protected. Hashes are actually MD5s. They're not. They're MD4s. But MD5 is taking participation in the whole process. Please look at the point number three, where we are mentioning MD5, and the point number five, where we are also mentioning MD5. So it's, in general, in a very general description, it's like we generate some kind of a key that comes out of the boot key, and the flat values, the constant values, and then on the top of that, we run the algorithms, and we hash, 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 we do this, we run that encryption by using that kind of a key, so we work on a key multiple times. It's a kind of funny operation, because you could technically, I mean, hire a whole military unit to calculate the key for you, but sincerely, who cares if the boot key is in the registry anyway, and anything we generate out from this, it's in the registry anyway, so it could be as strong as this world, but it's going to be as secure as our offline access is. Yes? So someone really used their imagination. I mean, that could be like twice, two slides long operation. We could be like, so what? If the disk is not encrypted, I'm getting access whether you are using 10 different algorithms or one in the exactly same way. Yeah? So uh, this is a kind of an ironic situation. But l long story short, we do produce a key in a point number five where that particular key is actually used to symmetrically encrypt the hashes of the user's passwords. So we've got an MD4 somewhere, and then that key is technically applied to that. So that's it. And question is now how we are able to get access to that database. Now, NTDS.dit, it's a bit of a challenge, because the format of the database, it's an EDB format. So it's not like some, which is a pretty straightforward database, which we could technically export to the text file, and it just contains simple records. Uh, NTDS.dit is a little bit more complex, because it's still an Active Directory. So how do we store it, A, how do we get access to it, let's talk about this, okay? So that's going to be our, our part here. So uh, just for the repeat, system, and of course we are getting access to the NTDS of it. Now uh, let's find it out. I've got here a machine, and let's do everything literally step by step, right? So um, the whole operation, of course, for the certain type of a machine, it's going to look like this, that we've got over here a uh, toolkit, let's do that, and then again, CQ Secrets Dumper, I will allow myself to rerun it, Secrets Dumper, here we go, boot key, and in order to copy the key from the different operating system, so we've got a, this one mark, and then we can copy this guy, and that's going to be actually something that we're going to be using, enter, I'm going to uh, use my local notepad over here, uh, because I'm going to be doing this on my local workstation, uh, so that um, it's a live demonstration, of course, with everything. Now, second part is NTDS, Audit and system. So, basically, uh, as long as you've got a boot key, you don't need a system hive, but in general, boot keys in a system hive. So either you take a system hive or the boot key, you decide. Now, second part here, it's to create a copy of NTDS.dit. Now, how many levels do we have over here? How many ways how we could actually create that copy? Well, way number one, we can create the shadow copy. This is the easiest way to do it. Yeah? So we can actually use that way, and I'm going to use this way. Another part is that if you don't have a VSS admin, and you don't have VSS admin with the possibility to create shadow copy on the client systems, so if you want to get access to some database offline, etc., then you have to either create a shadow copy by using um, WMI, which is an option, or what you can do, you can use the very nice toolkit, which is a forensic toolkit called uh, TSK Sleuth Kit. And TSK Sleuth Kit, it's one of the toolkits that is actually not the most pleasant in this world, uh, for sure, but uh, what it does, it technically goes directly to the number of the sector uh, that you need to number and copies cop makes a copy of literally a sector, so scratches file from the drive and then saves it as a data blob. Now, like in Linux or, or Linux, uh, we've got uh, iNodes. It's the same actually in Windows. Uh, it doesn't need to be called iNode, so it's an identifier of the file on the disk. It could be called an index, etc. But in general, TSK operates on those, so you need to get the index of the SAM database eventually and System Hive, and then copy that from the with the tool. So copy me everything that this iNode is indicating on, and then you are able to get these files this way. So many different ways. Yeah? Now, whenever we are thinking, of course, about that copy, we can do VSS admin, VSS admin, and then we can do create, mm -hmm. shadow, shadow, and then we can specify for what. So we do this for C, and then like this. And uh, yeah, we got basically this guy over here. 
so we can mark it. And uh, as, uh, as simple as this, what we're going to do over here is copy. And then we're going to technically paste um, that string over here. And then we're going to copy out from that the Windows System32 uh, config. Uh, no, not the config, sorry, my bad, my bad. Of course, it's ntds.dit, so ntds, and then ntds.dit, bang. Override, yes. So I've got that ntds.dit copied over here. So I can do start dot, and long story short, I can take this guy, control C, and I will just, just paste it somewhere uh, in my local box so that we can technically use the tools, and then um, we will be able to move forward uh, with the whole whole file, yeah? Uh, okay, so I've got, I've got that file uh, almost copied, so let me just uh, do that, here we go, and paste, I got it on my D drive, and then we, go, we are ready to go uh, with the tools that I'm going to launch over here. They don't need to be, of course, running as an administrator right now, because we are only working on data, so that we, at the end, are going to be decrypting the content of the ntds.dit file. So how does, how does this happen? Well, let's go to the D drive, tools, and that tool, by the way, is also available in um, uh, our blog. Now, the good news, or the bad news, is that A, it's not recognized by antivirus, of course, uh, but the good news for security is that Windows Defender ATP, um, so the machine learning based discovery, so, so intelligent threat detection, discovers that tool as the one that is actually for the credential theft. Because this is exactly what this tool does. I mean, there is no, I mean, you could use it for education, but in practice, there is no good use for extracting hashes from entities. That why, why we are doing this? So logically, it's incorrect. So, um, or, or security-wise. So that's why AETP actually discovers that tool. Not because of the tool itself, but because of what the tool does. And that's actually pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, let's do it. So we're going to get into CQ tools. Uh, lovely. And then uh, let me just do dear for the NTDS because we have over 200 tools, as I mentioned, and sometimes it's hard to remember all these names, but as long as you know what this is for, this is a characteristic for our tools, um, you will always find the tool by what this is for. So you think NTDS, you got it. You think DPAPI, you got it. So we try to keep the names uh, like this, but when you have over 200 names to figure out, they start to look crappy. Yeah? Okay, so uh, let's do it. Uh, so we've got a CQ, NTDS, etc. decryptor, and uh, that takes a couple of parameters. One of them, it's the boot key. Fine, we got this. So another one is file. We got that too. Another one is the out file. Yes, we will need to create it. And these two, the PFX file, it's what I was showing at the keynote. So you can also extract the PDF, so the, the um, a private key from the domain controller. And also KDS root key file, which I was not showing on the keynote because it's not really subject for the keynote, I would say. That is actually a little bit of a hardcore technical thing. That is a data protection API NG. It's a new generation crypto platform introduced in, uh, for real, Windows uh, Vista, but effectively used uh, in or since Windows Server 2012 or 2, while you were actually um, while you were actually leveraging, uh, at that matter, um, the possibility to, for example, store the PFX files that are SID protected. So you are exporting your private keys, and then either you're protecting them with password, or you are saying it's going to be only to be opened by me and you don't specify the password. Yeah, so that's that's the case. And it's not very often a used mechanism. BitLocker uses it for the SID protected drives, PFXs. Uh, group managed service accounts, they actually use data protection API ng and they rely on a Kerberos um, keys, and also uh, ASP.NET Core. And that's pretty much everything that I know where the data protection API is involved. Not too much. Okay, let's, let's have fun. So what we're gonna do, Let's uh, keep it a full screen. Uh, we will actually, at that certain point, uh, leverage all these parameters. Yeah, so we've got these guys here. Um, and get the hashes out. OK, so just arrow up. And then we're going to specify the boot key. And we're going to copy the boot key from the system that we've been touching the base on. There we go. Control C. And then we just paste it over here. Fantastic. And then we go File. And then we go to D, Tools, 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 NTDS, Dit. NTDS. This is the new one that I copied right now. And then here we specify the out file, and it could be hashes.txt. And we've got a PFX uh, file, uh, e.pfx, or whatever the name will be, and then KDS root key, KDS root key, and then we name it uh, kds.bin. 
for example. Um, okay, fine. So let's extract these data. Now, it may fail at the end, depends on the different situations, but let's see. Oh, actually, this was fine. Okay, good. Um, so we got what we want. Now, that looks a little awful at the beginning, but let me explain. Uh, in a domain, in a domain controller, Kerberos, by default, doesn't have any kind of a pre-keys generated. You generate them for the first moment, for example, you create the first group managed service account. So when you create the first group managed service account, then basically what happens is that uh, you have the command that you need to run, and this is the at KDS root key. I don't know if you guys uh, did it, but you only do it once in a lifetime of a domain controller. And then there's this funky mm, situation that Microsoft asks you to run it with the command effective immediately. Do you recall that? Some, some of you, okay. Effective immediately is kind of funny because it means that you are generating the keys right now, but that's fake because you are generating the keys in 10 hours. So basically, if you search for the add key, a KDS root key, effective immediately is actually kind of a little joke. Uh, so most of the people, what they do, they generate the Kerberos keys for the group manager service accounts, for example, uh, with the effective date minus 10 hours from the date that is up there set in future. So you're kind of like figuring out, yeah. And then what they do, they replicate, yeah. So this is how you are able to make sure that the Kerberos key is like all over. Now, why do we care about this guy? Because this is the guy that is used for so many things for your domain users. Uh, as we mentioned, BitLocker uh, drives. So if you have SID protected BitLocker drives, that's this guy. If that's going to be deleted, you're going to have a problem big problem, actually. Uh, well, you will not be able to get access to your drives in the name of your users, that's it. Uh, so another part is, of course, all the PFX files that were SID protected are also not accessible because you are not able to fetch the key from the domain, and that's the Data Protection API NG, new generation. And that's it, really. Um, so this is pretty much what we got uh, over here. Now, what happened uh, is that we've got, of course, here hashes. So let's get there, hashes. Um, hashes, hashes, uh, let me see, uh, okay, dot txt, fantastic, and um, we've got the hashes out there extracted from the domain, and they pretty much look like this, yeah? So, standard uh, operation over here, we've got, um, in this case, we are actually exporting uh, the hashes um, that are only the nt slash ntlm hashes, not the Lendl Manager hashes, even though they are over there, but they are empty in my case, so I'm not exporting them. If they were not, then we will technically give this information out here, yeah? Uh, how do we know that these are ntlm uh, hashes? Well, um, well, first of all, by the length, that's for sure. But the second, I can recall, because if you do deal with hashes a little bit, then password p at ssw 0 rd is actually MD4 of uh, E19 and so on. I almost know it by heart, so I can tell you that this is simply in a result of an MD4 uh, in the Microsoft variant. Yeah? So this is how you store it. Now, you can te technically get that and drop it into some kind of a, a cracker. And one of the tests that we like to do for the companies is that you take this database, you put it into uh, whatever, rainbow crack or OPH crack or whatever, or somewhere online, which you decide if you trust that kind of a services, uh, and um, you crack. And then you verify how many cra hashes of that they have been cracked in the first 30 minutes, for example. Yes, And usually it's approximately 10%. Yeah, so this is more or less, yeah, this is the average that we see by the customer side. What is funky discovery as well is that we see that if the, the administrators are using different accounts, let's say John underscore A for, admin, for domain admin, or uh, John underscore W for the workstations, etc., then uh, for the different types of administrators, what we see actually is that they are using the same password for all these accounts, yes. So th all these sins really come out when you look at this, yeah. Um, so you can verify that by actually not really violating anyone's privacy, yeah? uh, because the hashes will be simply speaking the same. And this is the situation that I have over here, that Freddy Krueger and Blee, uh, they do have the same password, yes, because of the uh, same similarity with the hashes. Okay, fine. So this is the case. Now, what are the other ways of extracting this? Yeah, so we did that with that particular in that particular way, but you can also do it in a little bit different way, live on the system. Yeah, so it depends on your situation really. So what I have over here, it's a second machine where we're going to be actually doing that kind of a test, and that kind of a test that can happen uh, with Python. And basically, uh, what we have over here is that 
Lite is a tool that is a free tool available on the GitHub. Also, the source code is available. Very useful tool for many other things, actually, for many other databases that has a f that have a format ESCDB, so EDB, ESCDB, like NTDS.DIT does. And also, a couple of other databases have this format. So it's not only for NTDS.DIT forensics, but could be used for that. So what we're going to do? Simple case as well. Let me just uh, copy the pretty much ready uh, NTDS.DID that I have. So I'm going to get uh, over here and uh, somewhere out there I have NTDS.DID. Uh, so control C. And what I will do um, over here, I'm just going to paste it uh, over here. Uh, I grabbed it by the VSS admin so we don't need to do it again. Um, and what's going to happen? ESCDB export is working on NTDS.DID in a very nice way. So what it does, it exports the tables, because it's not nothing but a database, from the NTDS.DID. These tables contain information. What you're going to do next about it, it's your choice. If our goal is to extract credentials, what we would need for that are two tables, actually. One is the data table, and another one is a link table. Why? Because data table contains users, and they are encrypted encrypted hashes. Hashes are always encrypted in the operating system. Hash is, of course, not reversible itself, but they are all encrypted as a form of a data. And link table contains keys that we're going to use to decrypt those um, <coughs> hashes to, to, to receive the hash at the end. And um, what is also necessary to grab over here is the same story. We need the system hive. And system hive I already have. Yeah? So uh, we're going to have fun with this one in a moment. Yeah? So I've got this NTDSD export. And uh, we're going to rename it maybe, and let's um, let's call it data. Okay, so I'm going to control X, and I'm going to paste it into my cracking tool over here, cracking uh, folder over here, and then we are good to go um, to get more information about what's going on. So I've got here also system, uh, so we're going to be working on the Python script right now. Now, good news and bad news about that, uh, not this folder, sorry. Here we go, NTDS X. Here we go, this one. Uh, good news is, um, it's easy. That's a good news. A bad news is, it's Python. And uh, the reason why I'm saying this that ironically, it's because for Python, you need to set it up. And it's not that much of a challenge, but uh, you, need go, you need to go through three processes here. First of all, download Python, of course, in a certain bit edition. Right now, 64 edition, 64 bit edition is fine. Uh, active Python to make it convenient, is also in a 64 bit, and DStorm 3 package. That's the one that will allow us to uh, work on that kind of a data. Plus, Python depends if you used it before or not. Will ask you also to download additional crypto module, but then it's going to fail and it's going to tell you how hey, you can do it this way. And you literally call Control c and Control v the command in order to get that module. Yeah? So it's a little bit of a hassle to set it up, but not that bad. Uh, what I do personally, by the way, I avoid setting up Python on many different systems that I have. I just set it up once and I copy the profile information all to all of my profiles when I'm using actually Python, and I have everything preset. That's the very convenient way of doing it. Okay, so you don't have to like have missing libraries or whatever. So we've got this one. Now, what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to use the script that is called DS hashes py, and DS hashes py, it's a script that is written by a good colleague of mine, Chaba Varta. He's from Hungary, and uh, he is actually an active directory uh, forensic investigator. Yeah? So that's his job, pretty much. Yeah? And uh, he wrote a set of scripts, free scripts. They are downloadable from his website, NTDS Extractor, that's the name. And you can play in the same way, literally, as I do right now. So we do DS hashes. And then for DS hashes, it says that we should give over here uh, the um, two tables, data table, so let's go data table, and then data, because I copied that folder over here, it's going to be link table, so we just specify link table. Yeah, two parameters, very easy. And then we specify that parameter password hashes, password hashes, and then it asks us to specify where is the system hive, for what? For the boot key. So this time we're not giving a boot key, but we are giving the full system hive 
I mean, there are plenty of options out there possible. Bang, and then that works. Um, so what's happening right now, it tries to decrypt with the keys that it has available, boot key and the keys that are in the link table, in order to give us a clear text hashes out there uh, from entities.did. How long does it normally take? Well, it depends. If you have an organization that is like, uh, let's say, hmm, last time what I was doing was like, five, six thousand people, something like that, it can take uh, five minutes, maybe up to 20 minutes, de depends on the size really. Yeah? So this is, this is what we're having. And over here, we have a little bit different output, and this is how our credentials are stored over here. Um, and the hash is indeed a credential because we are proving our identity with it. And over here, just to select the situation, that is for any type of a user really. That is LAN manager, so LM hash, like in a SAM database, exactly the same format, the same way of saving it, and that is, of course, um, anti-hash. This one is indicating that it's empty um, because it ends up with 404 EE, that it means that we are not using the LAN manager, yes? If you have problems with remembering that, um, I once remember that in a way that it's a 404, so it's a bad request or not existent. EE is an Estonian domain, so uh, yeah, bang, you got a pattern, yes? Not existent Estonian domain. Yes, so that's the way. Um, but you can figure out your other ways. I got all these weird ways to remember things. So um, here we go. Let's move forward. Some questions since it's not a keynote, etc. No? Okay. We're all good? Fine. So let's move forward. So what else is interesting? Basically, what I would like to show you is, um, and this is the next part of my demonstration, is how we are able to get credentials in the operating system by leveraging vulnerability. On the keynote, we were actually mentioning the pattern, attack pattern that user clicks on something, user does something, and then there's this shortcut that basically suddenly device is infected with malware and suddenly we are getting some kind of credentials. So it really depends on our situation, yes? Because there are different types of areas in the operating system when the credentials are stored, which we're going to be extracting still because it's all around that, that um, subject. But what I would like to show you is how we're able to escalate ourselves from one certain type of a user to um, to um, local system uh, apparently yes that's going to be our our path over here, so let me show you this. That's the, that's actually a pretty nice situation, uh, and this is this uh, vulnerability that I was talking about at the um, at the uh, keynote. So let me give you a little bit more details about that and how we are able actually to be the um, local system out of the regular user. So the thing is that. Um, in the operating system, uh, we've got uh, ALPC, Advanced Local Procedure Call. And this is a possibility to do something, to, to technically um, do, well, call for some kind of a procedure that will allow us to perform some security operation. And everybody has this possibility, and users too. Now, think about the vulnerability is this. We've got scheduled task in the operating system. And task scheduler um, allows us to create different types of uh, job files. And the problem is that user can do it, that that could be even okay, but even more, what user can do, and that is a vulnerability, by the way, it's patched already, so to be fair, it was patched on the 11th of September, but it's actually quite an interesting way of how we're exploiting it. Our team did a lot of research about that as well, so I would like to show you something really interesting, how you are able to elevate, and how does it look like when someone actually has that kind of a vulnerability. Um, so, Task scheduler allows you to create the task, of course, but what happens is that it also allows a user to call for a procedure to change the permissions on the task. And that's a problem, because what a user can do instead of creating a task is that user can create in the task scheduled folder, which is in a Windows folder, by the way, Windows tasks. Uh, so you've got over there possibility to write as a user. So basically, whenever you are getting into that folder, you are creating over there a symbolic link, which users can do, and you are changing the permissions to that symbolic link, but that symbolic link indicates, and it's a path, to some kind of an operating system file. So wh why does it work? Because you can call on the symbolic link being in a tasks folder in Windows, that type of a procedure. So anything that is in that folder behaves in a little bit of a special way. Yeah. So long story short, for real, you are changing permissions to some kind of a system file. And this is how you can become a local system. 
So it's really funny that someone found it because it's a big vulnerability in concept. Yeah? Now, patched already, thanks God. By the way, to be super fair with you, because it's already patched, so it's, I feel very okay to talk about it. Do you know that that vulnerability was out there for a couple of months? That was actually pretty awesome. Yes, so how do we feel about that? Yes, I'm leaving this to you. But in general, the, at the moment, it actually saw the daylight. It was already a couple of months old. Yeah, so we were wondering if we are okay because I mean we like Microsoft. Microsoft likes us. Yeah, so should we be objective and bring the danger out there? So no. So we're like, hey guys, maybe we can help you out to fix it quickly and do something about that. Uh, but yeah, that was the situation. So uh, let's leverage that a little bit and let me show you what does it mean for us to be vulnerable to this. So. We're going to be playing with the kill chain. So the regular user being a user becoming an admin. Yeah. So what's the situation? That workstation, by the way, um, it is actually a workstation that is isolated. Yeah. Uh, so we can just test the network connection for outlook.com and that's going to fail, etc. So that that workstation doesn't have any type of an access to the network, etc. Yeah. So yeah, here we go. Failed. Now what we're going to do? First of all, we will try to see if the app locker is on, because I'm going to use this vulnerability to actually disable app locker on a user. Yeah. Um, so we've got an application application um, security implemented. This program is blocked by the group policy, etc. So so this is clear. By the way, just to ask, guys in the back, can you see clearly? Yeah. Okay. No need to enlarge. Okay. Fine. Fine. Uh, that was my goal. So first of all, what we're going to do? We're going to copy basically MSI exec. Uh, because a user can always copy files to some kind of a demo folder that we had. Let's do it. Done. And we are verifying ACLs on MSI exec because we're going to be working on MSI exec. Now, what you guys need to know is that over here, if we get into details, we've got building administrators. Okay, allo. Building users, allo. Read and execute, synchronize. That's okay. Trusted installer, fine, of course, that these guys need to have privileged application package, blah, 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 blah. So this, these are the, the only permissions that we have over here. Now, the next part that we're going to do, we're going to invoke a zero day. Uh, let's do that, uh, F8. And uh, this is our PowerShell script. It's actually our custom PowerShell script for that. Happy to share. Uh, if you want. By the way, funny off-site comment, literally last week, um, our customer forgotten uh, the local administrator's password. Yeah, And they had a bit locker to drive. And they're like, oof, we are stuck. And there was like, recovery was poor. This whole situation was like that they couldn't get access to that box. Yeah, and they, they had to. But what they could do, they could actually log on with the cache logon data from the domain. Yeah, so we are like, is this workstation patched or not? And they're like, not. Okay, so let's use the vulnerability to actually uh, <laughs> recover. Yeah, a little bit kind of an illegal way of doing it, but why not? Yeah, uh, but now it's patched, so yeah. So we have to. Um, um, this will not work. Yeah. So basically, here what just happened is that please have a look. What just we added? What what have what kind of stuff we just added? We have added over here. The authenticated users allow for control. Yeah, this is what the invoke zero day did. So now we have a full control to MSI exec file, so we can do anything really. So what am I doing right now? I'm copying the item, and this is the disable app locker SVC. So this is basically our app locker disabler. It's not public yet, uh, as you can clearly imagine. It's not a positive tool, so we are hesitating if we should release it for education or not. If you will be interested, we are happy to share it with you um, as long as you promise that you will not use it for evil stuff. Yeah. So this is basically uh, the situation. So right now, our disabled app locker SVC is actually replacing right now Windows Update Service. Windows Update Service has a one cool feature. It starts only with a certain frequency. It's not running all the time. It only starts when it's updating. So it runs every certain certain period of time. We can, of course, start it manually. Start service MSI server, silently continue. Yeah. And this is really funny because we are kind of cheating right now on a service control manager. And service control, this service will never start. But service, when it's trying to start this way, by the way, um, sometimes we're like, oh, if I do create a service with a notepad, is Notepad actually executing? Because Notepad hasn't been written as a service. This is a kind of a nice hacking tip. And uh, Notepad will never start because it cannot talk to the service control manager. But for real, Notepad starts. It started actually, 
for the certain time while service control manager probes like, hey guy, like just talk to me, tell me who you are, register yourself as a service, and Notepad is like, dump. So basically, um, nothing happens. That's why service control manager says, uh -uh, something suspicious, die. So this is really what happened over here. We are kind of like doing the same. We're not responding to the service control manager. Besides, we don't want to talk to this guy. So at the end, um, it tries three times and it fails, but it run, runs. Yeah. So AppLocker is off. Question is, can we do that? Yeah, so let's find out. And right now, the same type of an application is working right now. Yeah. So we are right now acting, we are hooked in, we are acting as a part of the operating system, and I will explain in a moment why. Co so, so right now we're going to clean up, do a little bit of a clean up, because we don't need that stuff anymore. But that disable app locker does a bunch of additional things as well. So I will actually, I will uh, run uh, two things actually. This is basically uh, also some part of the Ignite presentation I was presenting. So that get console file is being created. And of course, it, we are leveraging over here WMI. So let's find out. Uh -huh. That's going to happen in approximately 40 seconds, I hope. I hope. Um, so that that vulnerability hooked into a WMI, fantastic repository, by the way, if you are want to be a bad malware writer, WMI is an amazing thing to settle yourself into because nobody verifies the um, at that point, the check some of the WMI because it's continuously changing, yes? So this is something that we will need to pay attention to. Uh, let me see. Okay, three, four, uh, yeah, so it's 10 past, always. It's 10 past, so we need to wait for that. Hopefully, it's going to be all good. And at the end of end, uh, we will need to wait for the get console. Uh, is it coming? Perfect. Yeah, so that's the moment where we are from the regular user becoming a local system, yeah? So this is this is the vulnerability we're talking about. Now, funny part, um, credential and um, related information. On the, on the um, keynote, I was mentioning that you are able to impersonate into t any type of a user. Not only that, by the way, in the operating system, you can create any token of anybody, um, technically, so that, um, so that you can be anybody you want to, but sometimes it's just meaningless because locally it means something because you can be a member of the users or admins, but in the domain it doesn't. Yeah? What I would like to show you, it's something interesting over here. While we're going to be actually um, getting access into the session of the user that is logged on out there. Yeah? So let's see of what we can do. And that's a bit of a secrets storage and user credential storage uh, situation. Task manager, we've got users and there is Sheriff, that's an administrator or, or regular user, actually Sheriff is a regular user, of that computer. And we can see over here that he's disconnected. Yeah? Now, even so, it doesn't matter because his session is still there yeah. Now, can we? Uh, let me go, let me go to the tools. Um, at that certain point, demos use the tool. So it's going to be CQ impersonate. It's an absolutely new tool uh, that we have released quite recently. And on the top of that, we're going to run impersonation into user secure because he's a domain user sheriff. Um, and then we're going to specify what we would like to run. We don't need to specify the passwords, CMD, and that's it. So what happens here, that was pretty quick, we are Sheriff right now, without the need of authentication, etc. And now, and that is kind of awesome, I if you start the process like this, you have access to all the secrets of Sheriff too. Yeah, so basically, as Sheriff, what I can do, for example, I can export in the operating system Things like, uh, well, data protection API data, so things like also SSH, uh, SSH keys, etc. So in the Windows, we've got in general um, possibility, and this is a new in Windows 10, by the way, to use the SSH. I don't know if you guys play with it a little bit, but you've got a full SSH client uh, on Windows, so you don't need to have Putty anymore. Um, and Sheriff uh, has that possibility as well. So what we're going to do uh, from the Sheriff's level, we will actually um, play with the tool and recover the keys that are uh, Sheriff's keys. So if we do SSH, we can try to run SSH add minus L, uh, not minus t uh, this one, but minus L. And then it says, and this is really funny, that it does not recognize that as an internal command. This is only happening in the impersonated console. That's not a problem. Because if we do have a look at the, uh, let's have a look uh, at the Cruella, 
that's this user over here. Yeah, exactly, that's my user. Uh, he's a regular user, uh, she's a regular user. Uh, then if we do SSH uh, add minus L, for example, yeah, then it says the agent has no identities. Yeah, because that works. And as is, this is a build in Windows, as we mentioned, and I'm trying to list different types of keys, and that doesn't work. So if it doesn't work over here for Sheriff, yeah, let me enlarge this font a little bit. Why don't we just export it and import it as a Cruella? Yeah, so we're going to do that. So in the demos folder, I've got a tool uh, which is called CQ SSH. CQ, CQ, here we go. Open SSH, blah, 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 agent key decryptor one of our newest uh, tools, actually. And within that, we are able to uh, specify the output that we would like to export the keys as a sheriff. And then we're going to use an export as a sheriff .xml. Fantastic. Uh, and wait, that's OK. Everything is predicted. Uh, for some reason, it also does not provide the access to the registry. Why not? Because it's not the user using these SSH keys. It's actually sheriff. So what we will need to do Technically, we will need to get at that certain moment to the registry. It's a funny way how SSH works in Windows. Um, and at that certain moment, we're going to actually go to the um, uh, current users. Uh, not the users, but uh, let me just see current user. Yes, exactly. We're going to go to software. Um, and we're going to go to Microsoft. Let me just find out that part over here. Was it this puff? Um, let me verify. Uh, the current user software. Uh, we should actually have that. Um, and we should have here open SSH somewhere. Uh, am I blind or what's this? So we've got a um, software, software classes, Microsoft. Now oh, that's kind of weird because uh, I should get that open SSH over here. Mm, let me find out. Uh, so we've got a current user for the sheriff. Um, software, yeah, that's kind of, maybe I just don't see it for some reason. Local machine, software, okay, that's kind of weird. Let me see. We should have this key over here, by the way. Uh, classes, classes, software. No, it is all good, um, because um, this is exactly the path that we should have. So we've got a, a system current user, yeah, this is the... This is the current users, uh, the current user that we need over here. But users, it's definitely not the case. We need a current user. Uh, yeah, maybe it should be in software actually. Uh, yeah, here we go. So it should be it should be somewhere out there. Uh, you know what? Uh, let me just search for it. Um, open SSH because um, that's kind of weird. Yeah. That's actually a bit weird because Sheriff should be there. So we've got a current user. Uh, yeah, it should be in software. It should be in software, actually. Ah, uh, wait. That kind of makes sense. Thank you for that. Ah, that's very good. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So it's going to be in one of these guys, yeah? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so basically, we should have this one somewhere here. So it's going to be either 20 or 21. Yeah. So we got a software, and then open SSH. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I got stuck a little bit. So permissions over here. Fantastic. Yeah. And then basically, uh, what we will do, uh, we will or we can technically add share over here. Yeah. And we can or we can add whatever users, and then uh, on the top of that. Uh, just one last thing, uh, literally, oh, let's just go, not users, users, come on, uh, users. Is it done? Or locations, sheriff, or users, sheriff is a member of users, so we could actually change the location, let's do it this way. Or it could be all my domain users too, okay, let's just use that. But why doesn't search for it? Let me see, okay, fantastic. And then we're going to give it a, uh, not, the, not this one, no, <laughs> definitely not this one. OK, uh, we've got OK, fine. And then let's see, of course, if we can uh, do that from the Sheriff's console. Fantastic. Yeah, so yep, and find out. Oh, why does it say so? Did we say it? That's awkward. Let me see. One more thing, actually. So system um, on the OpenSSH. 
let's see a full control. This guy, he's not a member of administrators as well, so let's find it out. Ah, oh, that's actually quite awkward. Um, yeah, something is wrong over here. Uh, well, we could we could use everyone. That's. Uh, did I sacrifice like a small cute sheep? No, I didn't. It's actually pretty sensitive for Ria, so let's verify if we can do that. No, it's still the same. It's kind of awkward, yeah. So um, we should we should at that point actually be able to to get that type of information, yeah. Uh, but what's the point? The point is that actually let me just do one more thing, because everyone it's one thing just for the sake of the demo, and then we are done. Yes. Let's just do authenticated users because everyone doesn't, would not probably do a job over here. So we've got our authenticated users and I think it's gonna be good right now. Apply, okay, we got it, let's do that. No. No, not really, no, 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 no. No, it should be, should be now it should be okay, yeah? So we've got everyone authenticated users allowed. Yeah, these guys, I mean, seriously, that's not really, yeah. But okay, yeah. So, for some reason, we cannot do that. Yeah. So we will. Well, we need to verify basically why why like that. But what's my point? My point is that finalizing, of course, that uh, that decryptor under the name of a sheriff supposed to be able to get our our files over here, our data. Yeah. So uh, one one thing that I can do try for the last sake actually, um, we could do that in an advanced. And one more last thing, replace, yeah, I think all child that could do for, this is like the last resort thing. And why not? That's better, okay. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. So uh, this is a key of a sheriff, yes? And basically the next thing we can do, and we are almost done, as a Cruella at that moment, we can technically import that particular key from a sheriff database and try to correct, connect somewhere in the sheriff's name because this is a connection details of the OpenSSH. So what we're gonna do, same story. So CQ, OpenSSH, uh, from the, uh, of course, E drive, and then we're gonna get into demos, and then let's get into CQ, OpenSSH, uh, agent decryptor, and then we're gonna import uh, from the file import sheriff, fantastic. And then, finally, finally, what I would like to show you guys is that that g girl has right now the sheriff's keys. Question is, can we connect uh, to the certain type of a box as a sheriff? And answer is, yes, we can try doing that. So we can use, uh, at that moment, SSH uh, sheriff at, and we're gonna be using uh, over here, uh, actually, we can, uh, one more thing, we can see basically that there is a certain type of a key and we can also display where these guys will be able to connect but um, by, by listing more details about the connection. But right now, what we could do, we could use the connection of the sheriff, so SSH, uh, fantastic sheriff, and then we're gonna do at uh, 10, 10, 10, 106, because this is one of the machines uh, out there waiting. Do you want to continue? Uh, yes, and basically, aha, uh -huh, yes. That's kind of stupid. Okay, fine, we've got this, and then who am I? Uh, we are connecting to the sheriff, host name, to different types of machine, IP config, and this is the 106 that we were talking about. So this is how you can impersonate in a different type of a user from identity perspective. So what's the conclusion? Yes, um, the conclusion is very straightforward. Uh, whenever we, of course, have different types of credentials stored in operating system, they're always stored in some kind of a way. In vast majority of ways, these ways are reversible, but 100% you can get access to any type of credentials in the operating system if you are on it. Yes? So this is a very obvious conclusion out there. Therefore, it's so important to control the access to the systems from the perspective of, as we were mentioning even on the keynote, the code that runs, and to verify who logs on and how, so the privilege access management to the certain workstations, because that kind of a data could be impersonated, extracted, etc. in a way I, I wanted to show you. So any time you store credentials in Windows, any type of credentials, just keep somewhere in mind that they can be extracted and they are extractable. Question is who and when is gonna do that. So this is a bit of a 
a summary for the credential security presentation. If you will have some questions, I'm happy to answer those because I bet you have because there are so many uh, issues about credential security out there in Windows. Just wanted to show you something interesting and new at the same time, which is the SSH and how actually we're able to steal the keys. Thank you so much, guys. And if you will, of course, want to have a look at the different slides and tools, etc., um, you can follow us on our blog, etc. So you all know, they all know this because I was already mentioning this on the keynote. But secureacademy.com is the place where we share information. Thank you so much, and thanks for coming.